Hello, and welcome back to the Shaky Sonnet Show. I am Tutila Trek, the drag laureate of the sonetarium, and here we are once again in the sonetarium at the bottom of the down staircase in the permanently sequestered remainder section of an unnamed local library which may or may not have a couple of lazy lions couchanting all over the steps looking as if they were the tired, worn out, sleepy muses that we're going to be encountering in sonnets 100 and 101 today. Now, when last we gathered, looking at the trio of sonnets 97, 98, and 99, I wondered where the story might lead us after the misty-eyed reminiscences of about the beloved. And I pondered if maybe a a complete shutdown of the narrator was a possibility. And indeed, it is. The two sonnets that we'll be considering today, sonnets 100 and 101, and actually the two that we'll be considering next week in our season finale, sonnets 102 and 103, are all for writer's block sonnets. Sort of. Now, many scholars say that they detect a large separation in time, in the, in the narrative line at least, um, between sonnets 100, 101, 102, and 103. But I've chosen to ignore the scholars because, in my mind, sonnets 100 through 103 form a nice accent to the despair of loss and melancholy and absence that are expressed in the trio we read last week, 97, 98, 99. And what better way to follow up melancholic despair than with writer's block? This is a tremendously eloquent writer's block in which the narrator expertly chides his muse, but still the writer's block, a writer's block all the same, sort of. Um, turns out if he can't write sufficiently about his beloved, he'll write about his disappointments with the muse. So, Sonnet 100, let's look at that first, and then we'll delve into the specifics, if you will, and you will, unless you turn me off. <laughs> Sonnet 100. Where art thou, muse? that thou forgetst so long to speak of that which gives thee all thy might. Spent'st thou thy fury on some worthless song, darkening thy power to lend base subjects light? Return, forgetful muse, and straight redeem in gentle numbers time so idly spent. Sing to the ear that doth thy lays esteem, and gives thy pen both skill and argument. Rise, resty muse, my love's sweet face survey. If time have any wrinkle graven there, if any, be a satire to decay, and make time's spoils despised everywhere. Give my love fame faster than time wastes life, so thou prevents his scythe and crooked knife. So, that's Sonnet 100. The entire sonnet is about appearance versus reality, beginning with the fact that in berating the muse, the narrator is in fact berating himself or herself, there's no indication. Um, he's not berating the muse, he's berating, I tend to fall back on he. Um, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, so the narrator is berating himself or is he berating the muse? Where art thou muse in the very first line? is possibly saying, where did my inspiration go? Or where is the thing that used to inspire me about my beloved? Or where is my beloved? Or where are my artistic powers? Where art thou muse that thou forgets so long to speak of that which gives thee all thy might? Spence thou thy fury on some worthless song, darkening thy power to lend base subjects light? Are you muse or have I been spending too much time on subjects not worthy or less worthy than my beloved, you know, my cheating, vain, nowhere to be found beloved that I've talked about in the first 99 sonnets. And even though it seems like the poet shuttles blame off of him or herself onto the muse, um, blame for the lack of inspiration, 
In reality, perhaps he, I'll stick with he to make it easier, he is not really mourning the loss of poetic powers. Perhaps he's mourning the loss of love itself. Hard to tell. In the second quatrain, we go from just where art thou muse to return forgetful muse. So the name calling starts. Not just muse, forgetful muse. Redeem in gentle numbers, gentle numbers, poems, metrical form. Um, redeem in gentle numbers, time so idly spent. Sing to the ear that doth thy lays esteem and gives thy pen both skill and, arg and esteem. I'm sorry, and argument. So the argument is apparently my beloved. Thy lays, lays is just a term for song and it's derived from the French. It's the kind of poems that the minstrels used to sing. And yes, there is a part of me that mapped a sexual connotation onto lays, but it turns out that usage wasn't even really current until the 1930s in America. And there are some instances perhaps on the stage of lay being used in a sexual connotation in the 1700s, but it seems to be too late for Shakespeare, which, you know, is one of the dangers of reading it as a modern reader, but it's still interesting all the same. And then I also think to myself, well, there is that lay in the Bible where a man shall not lay with another man. So I don't know. I think I'm onto something here. In the third quatrain, we go from where art thou muse to return forgetful muse to rise resty muse. Now, there's a term for you, resty muse. It does give the impression of this lazy hunk of burning love perhaps next to the poet in the bed, rise and sit up, muse, and look upon my beloved's face. If time have any wrinkle graven there, if any be a satire to decay, and make time's spoils despise it anyway. Come and look upon my lovely, lovely beloved's face, and see how lovely he or she is, and if you see a wrinkle there, laugh it away, be a satire to decay, or perhaps a satyr, which is in mythology, half man, half goat, and was known for um, biting satire as well. And in the in the 1609 quarto, satire here was capitalized and italicized. So perhaps there is something to that satire as well. Just another layer to think about. So when we get to the couplet, give my love fame faster than time wastes life. So thou prevents his scythe and crooked knight. knife. And so come back, the narrator is saying, come back, muse, before either my beloved gets old and dies, or before I get old and die, or possibly before our relationship gets old and dies. And before our relationship gets old and dies, well, I have news for you, pal, that Hearst rolled up a, a couple of dozen sonnets ago, just in case you didn't know. So Don Patterson, in his witty little way, in his uh, reading Shakespeare's sonnets, Don Patterson, says that line 13, give my time, give my love fame faster than time wastes life. Patterson says that line 13 scans like a drunken clog dance, which I find quite delightful. And in the 14th line, the last line, this scythe and crooked knife gives us a chance to pause and have a little drinky poo because our vocabulary word for the day, cocktail party vocabulary word, is hendiadis, H-E-N-D-I-A-D-Y-S, which is saying the same thing in other words. Scythe is a crooked knife, so there's no reason to say scythe and crooked knife. But commentators have defended the doubling by noting that crooked carries the con connotation of crooked old age. And I have to say that since we saw a different knife, a phallic knife in Sonnet 95, this uh, the hardest knife ill-used doth lose his edge. I think there is perhaps a, a hint at loss of sexual potency, I think. But then there's this business about fame. 
give my love fame faster than time wastes life. It's almost as if fame is more important than the beloved in this poem. So something's going on here. The beloved seems to be taking a back seat. We move right along to Sonnet 101, and this is Sonnet 101. O oh, truant muse, what shall be thy amends for thy neglect of truth in beauty died? Both truth and beauty on my love depends. So dost thou, too, and therein dignified. Make answer, muse. Wilt thou not haply say truth needs no color with his color fixed? Beauty no pencil, beauty's truth to lay. But best is best if never intermixed. Because he needs no praise, wilt thou be dumb? Excuse not silence so, for it lies in thee to make him much outlive a gilded tomb, and to be praised of ages yet to be. Then do thy office, muse, I teach thee how, to make him seem long hence as he shows now. So we go from muse to forgetful muse to resty muse, and now truant muse, not just to sleep on the job, but missing entirely. So again, we've got appearance versus, versus, versus reality. What shall be thy amends for the neglect of truth in beauty died? Now, at first the sense seems to be truth in beauty died, truth steeped in beauty or truth covered in beauty. But since we've seen in previous sonnets the narrator's hatred of cosmetics, I can't overlook the sense that perhaps truth is being covered up with dyes and colors and makeup. Oh my. So this is maybe a bit of a backhanded compliment to the beloved or perhaps an utterance of a subconscious qualm. And the first quatrain seems to be saying that my loves, my beloved is truthful and beautiful and you are nothing without him. And him we see for sure in line nine, you're nothing without his truth and beauty, because if he wasn't truthful and beautiful, then you'd have nothing to write about. So there. Except, well, you know, this sonnet chastising you for not being able to write convincingly about his truth and beauty um, is sort of me writing about his truth and beauty. So I don't know how that's going, but we'll ignore that. The line also, both truth and beauty on my love depends is rife with pos several possible meanings in my view. My love, meaning my lover, or, or the love that I hold for my lover, and then depends, hangs off of my lover, and who among us doesn't like a well-hung lover, um, but also perhaps depends as in depends as a prerequisite. Without truth and beauty, I won't love him. And also, without truth and beauty, you wouldn't have anything to write about without his truth and beauty. So, to me, the first quatrain seems to be full of half-realized, possibly ugly truths. In the second quatrain, the petulance and perturbation about what the narrator may be slow to realize in the first quatrain rises up in the second. Make answer, muse. All right, honey, just calm down. Make answer, muse, wilt thou not haply say truth needs no color with his color fixed, beauty no pencil, beauty's truth to lay but best is best if never intermixed. And here again comes a diatribe against makeup, which, you know, a queen just can't catch a break in this sonnet. We know how Shakespeare hates makeup. We know how the beloved doesn't need makeup to make him beautiful, but whatever. Um, he seems to be protesting a little bit too much. And he doesn't need these extraneous things like colors, makeup, or even good report sonnets. But yet, I think back to Sonnet 93, where the narrator says, So shall I live, supposing thou art true like a deceived husband. So love's face may still seem love to me, though altered new. And I can't get that out of my mind. Perhaps the muse is the undeceived, 
truth teller here who doesn't praise what isn't praiseworthy. So maybe that's why the muse has gone missing. In the third quatrain, the narrator argues against himself. He says, because he needs no praise, wilt thou be dumb? So, okay, master, mistress, muse, if you're saying by your conspicuous silence that you've gone missing and won't praise him because he doesn't need praise, well, that's a bad argument. He must be praised to immortalize him so that he could outlive the gilded tomb to be praised for ages yet to be. Without my praise, he's saying, my love dies. My lover dies, my love for him dies, my, the record of my love for him dies, perhaps. So then we get to the couplet. Then do thy office, muse, get to work. I teach thee how to make him seem long hence as he shows now. And here we have appearance versus reality again. Seem and showing. Um, I teach thee to make him seem as he shows now, as any self-respecting deceived husband would or should or could do. Um, there seems to be something beyond the surface going on here, perhaps a subconscious weariness. The muse is gone for one reason or another. Nobody knows quite why. So I have said, male or female, we know that the beloved is a male, as the beloved really has been in the last hundred sonnets. So no big surprise there. Dramatically, where does this land? Is there a play where the character is so blindly in love that he or she doesn't see the reality that the beloved's just not that into you? I don't know. You tell me. Maybe, um, oh, the one, I can't remember which one it is. The one where the, the, her brother has gotten someone pregnant and then she goes into a nunnery and then the, the lord of the land, um, who's supposed to be upright and pure, begins to lust after this little nun and brings her and gives this whole idea. I can't remember what that's called, but that's the one. Perhaps that could fit there. Maybe I'll link it below somewhere. Um, narratively, what's going on here? As I said before, some scholars see a long expanse of time in the narrative between 99 and this group of four, 100, 101, 102, and 103. I don't. In my mind, and I will go off on a slight tangent here, my mind does change. When I look at these sonnets, I look at them, you know, I read them, I look up the scholarship about them, I try to figure out what's going on in them, and yet each time I come to them anew, my mind could change one way or the other, depending on what the narrative is. And the fact that the beloved's voice is, is squelched for the most part throughout, it gives us a wide berth to invent a lot of what might be going on or what might not be going on. And the duplicity of the language and the multiplicity of the language gives us even greater uh, space to invent about what may or may not be going on. So to say that there is one definitive thing that is going on is quite foolish. And um, I mean, although some might say that a, grown man who gets all dolled up in dragon decides to prevent, present all 154 signs is also foolish. And to those people, I say, hi. So um, I do think that the signs contain a multitudes of commentaries on the human conditions and all its intricacies. Um, but in the end, it's up to us all to grapple with all of the meanings and juggle all the possibilities and let them bubble about in our brains while attempting to boil it down into some one coherent story, many of which seem similar. So um, that's why we're here. But as I was saying, in my mind, sonnets 100 and 103 are either writer's block sonnets, sonnets about new love, possibly, sonnets about self-doubt, definitely, and, or sonnets about appearance versus reality, definitely. Particularly appearance versus reality in a failing relationship or a failed relationship. 
and I believe they fit very nicely after that trio of sonnets 97, 98, and 99. So we've gotten to sonnets 100 and 101. Next week we'll be looking at 102 and 103 for the season finale. We'll have one more go at it next week before we take a break for the summer. But in the meantime, let's all blink our eyes to see if we can sort through appearance versus reality and focus, focus, focus on all the wonders that are in our world and pay attention until we meet again. I am Too Tight Lechek. Mm -hmm.